Hi, I'm Dom, the BCBA mom, and welcome back to my channel. So today I am going to debunk some of the most common myths about ABA or becoming a BCBA, right? There's a lot of information out there. And, and sometimes it's just other people's opinion or their specific experience, but I want to address some of those most common myths that you may have heard about ABA. But before we get started, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. That way you get notifications when I upload new content because it just keeps getting better. All right, let's get right into it. So the first myth is that ABA is only for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Okay, so this is incorrect. As a matter of fact, when I first started my career in ABA, probably only 30% of my clients had an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, right? So a lot of my clients, they had um, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, um, Down syndrome, like the list is endless, right? It's not just for individuals with ASD. So when you think of why um, autism spectrum disorder and ABA are so closely paired together, is because the insurers have identified that this is the science that will help a person with um, autism spectrum disorder make the most progress when it comes to social skills, cognitive development, um, speech development, and a lot of other things. But when you are a BCBA, you don't only have you don't only have to work with individuals that are autistic. You may. I also worked in schools, and I worked with general education students. Right? You can work in home with typically developing children who just need some structure and resources on how to complete their chores or structures and resources on how to um, meet academic goals, right? ABA is not just for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. However, if you do not have an ASD diagnosis, you are less likely to get ABA covered by your insurance unless you have a different funding source, like you have a grant program or you're on a Medicaid waiver or you're paying out of pocket where the school is paying for your services. So the autism spectrum disorder will allow for your insurance company to pay for your ABA services, but that is not the only way to get ABA services. And you don't have to have an autism diagnosis in order for ABA to be effective, okay? The second myth is you have to work in a clinic with individuals with autism in order to get your supervision hours. This is not correct. Um, personally, I've never worked in a clinic. I've worked in a lot of different settings. I've worked in group homes. I've worked in day programs. I've worked in communities, but I've never worked in a clinic and I'm still a BCBA. So working in a clinic is very common. It's a lot of people's very first interaction with ABA. Um, I think it's a really great first interaction with the field because it's very contrived and controlled and you can learn on the terminology, you can learn about the practices, the procedures, the concept, concepts in a very controlled environment, right? When you are not in that controlled environment, when you're in their natural environment, when you're in their home or in the community, everything doesn't work as perfectly, right? So I think working in a clinic first is a really great introduction to the field, but it is not the only way to be, to work effectively in this field. And it is not the only way to get your supervision hours. Actually, working in a clinic can sometimes prevent you from getting your supervision hours because the board wants you to have more unrestricted hours than restricted hours, meaning the board wants you working less directly with the client, carrying out programs, discrete trial trainings, and they want you working more on assessments, creating behavior plans, analyzing data, all of the background stuff. So if you think that working in a clinic is going, is like the only way to get your supervision hours or the only way to become a BCBA, that is not true. You can work in group homes. You can work in 
a client's home, you can work in schools. If you are a teacher or a paraprofessional, that's a way to get your supervision hours as well. You can literally get your supervision hours anywhere because we can literally apply this science everywhere, just as long as you have an approved supervisor who will sign off on your work. Okay. Another myth has to do with passing the BCBA exam, okay? So there is a myth out there that if you don't pass the BCBA exam, BCBA exam on the first try, then you're just trash. Like you're a trash therapist and everybody's gonna know about it, right? You have to put this stamp on your head like I'm a third time test taker, I'm a fifth time test taker, that is not true. No one knows how many times it took you to take your exam and no one really cares, right? Now, if you go on the, BA, the BACB website, it will tell you when you pass the exam and it will tell you how many more tries you have to take the exam. So you have, so that's the only way that you can tell how many times a person had to take the exam in order to pass. But I know some really awesome BCBAs who, are multiple test takers, right? And I know some not so great BCBAs who pass on the first try. So learn, passing the BCBA exam is not a direct reflection of how you are going to implement this science in your natural environment because everyone's natural environment is going to be different. I think it has to do with your experience. Yes, it has to do with the knowledge and how you are able to pass the exam because the exam is testing your fluency on the concepts and procedures and the terms. But just because you're not a first time test taker and passer does not mean that you will not be a good BCBA. And truth be told, no one is gonna know unless you tell them how many times it took you to pass the BCBA exam, okay? All of my friends who are BCBAs, we don't sit up and talk about how many times did it take you to pass, how many times did it take you to pass, and then we like hierarchy ourselves according to, well, I'm a first time test taker, so I'm the best. It took you two times, so you're after me. It took you three times, so you're like, no, no one does that, okay? You may think that to yourself, but I'm telling you right now, it does not, it does not justify how you are going to impact this field as a clinician. So if you are a multiple test taker, if you haven't passed the test yet, please don't be discouraged, okay? Because the field, we're still waiting on you. Your potential clients are still waiting on you to make an impact, so please don't give up. We need you, okay? Keep going. Another myth is that you have to be a BCBA in order to open a clinic. That is not true. Anybody can open an ABA clinic just like anyone can open a doctor's office. Anyone can open a, any job. Anyone can start any company or any agency. Um, currently, I work for an agency where the owner is not a BCBA. The caveat to that is, if you are providing ABA services, you're gonna have to hire a BCBA. So either you are the BCBA that starts that company or you have to hire a BCBA within that company, but you don't necessarily have to be a BCBA in order to start a clinic or a private practice. If you are asking my personal opinion, it all depends on what your, goal, what your goals and what your values are. If you just want to be the person that runs the operations and the procedures and have the brick and mortar and you don't really um, want to have an impact in like the clinical work, then just hire a clinical director, hire a BCBA. But if you are in the field and let's say you're an RBT and you're trying to be a BCBA and you're like, you know what? This is too much work. I'm just gonna stay in RBT and I'm going to open up my business. I wouldn't encourage that, right? Um, only because if you're gonna put that much effort into opening a business, you should just put that much effort into being the BCBA that is um, that will adhere to the ethical guidelines, that will continue to get the CEUs and continue education, that will know exactly what you need in order to run your business. So, um, so my suggestion is if you are in the field and you are 
your goal is to become a BCBA and a business owner, don't shortchange yourself. Finish out the program, become a BCBA, practice as a BCBA for a couple of years while you're still starting your business. Um, that way, when you bring in another BCBA, when you bring in a clinical director, when you bring in all of these staff and RBTs, you know exactly what they need. You know how to give it to them and you can give it to them if you decide to, or you can just wear the owner hat, but at least you know what, what is going on within your company and what are the requirements in order to keep it up and running. The next myth that I want to address is that ABA teaches you to be robotic and to only have one response. Um, if you're doing it incorrectly, then yes, it can look like that. But what we try to do is plan for generalization. So if I'm teaching a kiddo how to greet and say hello, um, I'm teaching that in a variety of ways. It's called multiple exemplar training. So I'm teaching him how to say hello. I'm teaching him how to say, what's up? I'm teaching him how to say, I'm teaching him so many different responses to greeting, right? If I am teaching him how to order his food, you should be teaching your client to do a behavior in a variety of different ways, right? Everyone is not going to ask you the same question the exact same way. And if you only know how to respond to a question being asked in a certain way, then it can make you sound like a robot. Or if you only know an array of responses, it can make you sound like it's not a genuine back and forth intrapersonal conversation. So a good BCBA should always plan for generalization. They should have multiple exemplar training and they should be training a skill across multiple settings, multiple stimuli, multiple, and across time to make sure that behavior that that behavior looks more natural. Another myth, and that kind of taps into the one that I just mentioned, that ABA is just sitting at a table and running drills. Once again, personally as a BCBA, I mostly work with adults and my adults, they don't want to sit at a table and run drills. They want to go out into the community. So I've never really been a fan of doing ABA at a table. Now that all depends on the person's functioning level, their your level of instructional control, um, their level of responding to instructions. So there are a lot of variables that will determine where you're gonna do your therapy session, right? Sometimes at the table may be the most appropriate setting for therapy in that moment. But once again, you should be planning for generalization and life doesn't happen at a table unless we're talking about a dinner table or a cards table or um, a desk at a school, right? So we should be running sessions in natural environments and not just at a desk running session. So for example, um, I used to have a client and I would give him picture cards and he would have to identify the things, the, the, the items that were on the picture cards. And then I realized, okay, he has mastered this goal. This is no longer effective. Let's go for a walk and see if he can identify safety signs in his natural environment. To me, that was more to me that was more beneficial for him than to sit at a table and to identify pictures that he may never come in contact with. But if he's out in his community, he's always going to come in contact with a red light, a stop sign, um, beware of dog sign, a do not walk on grass sign. All of those different signs that will help keep them safe in the environment. So no, ABA is not just sitting at a table running drills. That would be so boring. That would be so boring. Another myth is that ABA encourages bribery. So people can, and the last myth that I have time for today is that ABA will heal my child. 
So ABA does have some amazing, impactful effects on behavior to the point where a child can be undistinguishable amongst typically developing peers, right? So for example, um, if a child was diagnosed with autism because of meeting certain, um, certain criteria or requirements, if they have enough ABA therapy and they are effective and efficient with that ABA therapy, um, who's to say that two years from now, four years from now, six years from now, due to maturation, meaning they're just maturing and growing and developing, and coupled with therapy, now that child that was obviously showing autistic qualities can be undistinguishable, meaning they are still autistic, but they are not overtly showing those characteristics of autism to where it impedes their life, right? ABA does not cure autism, right? It helps support individuals with autism so they can have a great quality of life and meet whatever goals that they want to meet. Okay. There have been times where ABA has worked so well that the insurance company will say this individual no longer needs ABA services because they have progressed so much. Some people will call that my child being healed, my child no longer has autism. That is not true. That just means they don't need this level of support or um, right, they don't need this level of support in order to be independent in life. Um, once a person is autistic, they will likely always be autistic in some way, but they will learn to conform their behaviors to societal norms or, or they will create a, a, a supporting group around them that is accepting of who they are. Okay, so our goal is not to heal autistic people because they are not broken. Um, they don't need fixed, um, but they do need help and support in order to meet their goals and to have the best quality of life from their perspective. I'll give you a bonus myth. A lot of people think once you pass the BCBA exam and become a BCBA, that is it, the struggle is over, you have made it, that is not true. Once you pass the BCBA exam, that is only the beginning. I've said it in previous videos, the hard part is not becoming a BCBA, the hard part is staying a BCBA, staying within our ethical codes, our ethical guidelines, um, maintaining and keeping your CEUs, um, maintaining integrity, in some of these situations, right? So don't think just because you pass the test like, oh, my life is about to be peaches and cream, strawberry and roses. I don't know what the analogy is. I'm just naming things that I like. That's when the real, real work starts. So I am glad that you are a part of this channel that you are joining me on this journey, that you are sharing parts of your journey with me because I wanna be with you through the whole process. While, while you're thinking about becoming a BCBA, while becoming a BCBA, and after you have become a BCBA, I still want to help support you with parent training and advocating and debunking some of these myths that society thinks about us, okay? So, Thank you again for watching this video. If you like, if you liked anything that was said in this video, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe so that you know when I upload new content and, and I will see you on the next one. Bye.